My name is Crystal Rose. I'm the manager of digital learning at Mystic Seaport Museum. And we are excited today to bring back part two of Nicholas Alley's um, introduction to charts and navigation. So um, I'm guessing that probably a lot of you were here with us last week. So we're excited to have you back. And if it's your first time, welcome. And um, the, the first program will be made available on the Mystic Seaport YouTube channel. So uh, stay tuned for that link and you feel free to email me um, if you have questions about how to find it. So just really quickly before I introduce Nicholas, we love for these programs to be interactive as uh, for many of you that have joined us before, you know how this works. We, um, we will uh, answer questions that are in the chat box. So put whatever questions or comments you have in the chat box. I will be navigating and moderating the chat and I will interrupt Nicholas um, every so often and uh, ask him a question from the audience. So feel free to communicate with us in that way. And I think that's probably pretty much it for me. Uh, we're excited to have everyone uh, from so many different places. So it's so fun reading where you guys are from. So we really appreciate you joining us today. So Nicholas Alley is the Yacht on Exhibit Operations Coordinator. It's a really long title, Nicholas, <laughs> for Mystic Seaport Museum. And uh, Nicholas, I'm gonna just turn it over to you to start the program. I'm gonna switch up the spotlight cameras. Let's have it on you there. All right, you good to go? Uh, yes, indeed. Awesome. Thank you very much, Crystal. And uh, yes, it is a, a difficult title to sometimes pronounce. Uh, basically means I take care of our donated boats, so it's not uh, not that highfalutin. Um, but it is uh, it is nice to be working with the Seaport and uh, doing special programming like this. This is this is a lot of fun, and it's kind of a new thing for me. So uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, patience as I stumble my way through some of this computer stuff. Uh, well, welcome back, everybody, or welcome if you were a first-time visitor, and uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on. Um, you know, chart plotting and reading charts uh, is one of those skills that just takes time and, and, and efforts doing it, and, uh, and then the added part of navigating using these charts and using the tools that, that uh, are associated with them uh, also it can be tricky at times. Um, it's very easy to get started, but it's one of those skills that you can you can get better at it the more you practice and uh, I'm, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm still learning learning things so so it's a great way to just keep your brain active um, last week we looked at some maps and charts uh, and some tools and some basic stuff and I was hoping to continue that this week uh, we'll do a little bit of a re review pardon my words there uh, I'm going to introduce some new items uh, that you can play with today and then I thought probably the best way for us to show how navigation works is to actually plan a route and pretend navigate our way from uh, Mystic Seaport out to Block Island. And this offers us uh, two or three different environments, two or three different charts and different procedures along the way. And this hopefully will give you a nice overview of, uh, of some of the techniques that we use in basic navigation. Um, I know the skill levels vary a bit and uh, and as crystal said you know please feel free to ask questions and we'll answer them if we can uh and uh and we'll go with that so i'll go ahead and get started here with the new items um if uh, we'll switch down and we'll look at the camera that's uh, at my 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 desk and uh you can look right here i have uh, what's known as a as a uh, cruising guide and this is a cruising guide to the New England coast. And you can see that uh, this is Beaver Tail Light, which is at the head of Narragansett Bay, just outside of Newport. And, uh, and basically, uh, a cruising guide is a booklet that tells you about the area in which you're sailing, uh, both from a navigational standpoint, but also just from uh, a living standpoint. It'll tell you where you can get fuel and so on and so forth. This one here at the bottom says it covers Block Island, Rhode Island to the Canadian border. And so uh, I, I highlighted Block Island today because that's where we're going to be going. And uh, I wanted to, you know, uh, show some of the tools that we would use even before we leave. And some of the uh, navigating takes, uh, takes, uh, takes practice before you even, even leave, leave the harbor. So we're going to look up uh, Block Island here and, uh, and we'll look at some of the stuff that's available. Here's a chartlet of uh, the actual harbor itself a great salt pond, which is the, the one big anchorage in, uh, in, in Block Island. 
and I've been there many, many a time. Brilliant has been going there for something like 65 years. Here's another chart that's showing all of Block Island. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more detail a little bit later on. But it also has a bunch of text and it talks about, you know, what you can find there, the services that are available. This is all about marinas and docks and getting fuel and water and some of the things that you need. There's information about anchoring, the number for the harbor master, you know, where the hospital is, all of that is available here in these, in these um, cruising guides. Um, so it is a very handy reference, and these are available at, you know, uh, your regular West Marine or any Marine store. This is from Matt Tech there, so you see that. So, so that's one of them. Um, another favorite in our business uh, is something that's unique to the, the area here, the Eldritch Hyde and Pilot Book. And as it says right here, it's the most trusted guide to the East Coast since 1875. And basically what the Eldridge, uh, Mr. Eldridge did is he started doing tide tables and it's grown to become just a, a legendary sort of source of information. And as you would expect, it's got tide tables in here, but it also has currents and some of that we covered last time. Um, but it's also got everything from the setting of the sun and the moon and definitions and stories. These come out every year and, uh, and <clears throat> they are carried on just about every boat that I've ever sailed on. Um, it's, it's kind of funny, a, a little while back, uh, somebody on Facebook typed in and said, uh, yeah, as you will imagine, a lot of, a lot of my Facebook friends are, are boat captains or boat people, and uh, they said, uh, Eldridge, is, how, how many people use it? And uh, something like 25 or 30 people replied that they wouldn't even leave the harbor without an Eldridge on board. And one of the beauties of it is that it's a quick and easy guide. So I'll open it up to a couple of pages that we have here. Um, this one here uh, is talking about time of high water or time of low water. And since, uh, since we're getting ready to depart, uh, I, I wanna know what my tides are gonna look like. And so we've got that. And uh, basically these are reference stations, excuse me, these are subordinate stations. And uh, they refer to, uh, some of the major reference stations, in this case, Newport or Bridgeport. And uh, so I went out down here, I went down to Stonington where we are here in Mystic. And if I go to Bridgeport and I look it up, I'll get that tide information. We're gonna play with this a little bit later on. Um, the other one is currents. And this is the currents in Long Island Sound. And we talked a little bit about currents, particularly in the race. And the race is that area where Long Island Sound meets the, uh, the North Atlantic or Block Island Sound. And the current can be very strong in that area. And uh, it's strong enough that you gotta worry about it, uh, depending on what you're doing. So we would go into this table here when we would get the, the, the currents for the day and find out what's happening, whether we're gonna be fighting the current uh, against us or working with it as we work our way out the sound. Um, this uh, diagram here might look a little familiar. And uh, we looked at a current table last week and, uh, and you can see this is the same current table, but just in a smaller format. And you can see all these little arrows which indicate where the tide is going and when. Uh, this one here basically says when the ebb starts at the race. And I went into the book and I found out when the ebb started. So that's what the tide would look like. An hour later, it would look like this. And if you look right in this section, you can see that these arrows will start to speed up as we get closer and closer towards the middle of the tide and the tide runs the fastest. And as I said last week, um, it could be particularly dangerous because the tide runs so fast in that area, okay? Uh, we also have things like uh, the rule of 12s, which tells us that the first hour of the tide, you have one 12th of the tide, the second hour you have two 12s, so on and so forth. Um, here is a wonderful diagram that shows what all the tide meanings, what mean high water spring versus uh, mean high water neap. And that just gives you a little indication of, uh, of the differences in high and low tide. Everybody seems to think it's just a standardized thing, but it actually varies quite a bit and you have to be ready to compensate that. This fella here is, uh, is an old fashioned uh, lead line and this is the way they used to check the depth. And he will swing this forward and then let it go and uh, out in front of the boat. And as the boat sails up, when that line is vertical, he knows how deep the water was. This is how they checked the depths back in the old days before they had electronic depth sounders. And, uh, and this one right here is just one of the many 
tabulated information that we have. And this converts from uh, seconds of latitude uh, to minutes of, uh, uh, tenths of a latitude. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And then table of equivalences, you know, one mile equals 660, 680 feet and nautical mile or 5,280. So, but there's a lot of great stuff in here and I highly recommend you got to take a look at this, the visibility of the planet. So you can look at this and find out which planets you're looking at in the night sky, the compass rows and variation and We'll get into that during today's lecture, okay? Um, another thing we have is this, and this is what they call a nautical slide rule. And this is gonna help us determine uh, our speed and our distance. And we have distance, we have speed, and we have time. And if we know two of these pieces of information, we can solve for the third. And we're gonna do that as we voyage our way out to Block Island. Um, we talked a little bit about compass corrections. And this right here is what we call a deviation card. And this is for Schooner Brilliant. And you'll notice that it's gonna tell me when we have errors in the compass. So for instance, on a Southeast course, I'm gonna have one degree of error, which is not very much, uh, but that can, it can be substantial. And these deviation cards will give you a, a way of answering some of the questions when it comes to compass error, okay? We'll be working with that later. This is a handy little toy. Uh, this is a quick reference coastal piloting chart. And a lot of the information we have has been uh, put into uh, easy to understand information. So here is a diagram showing the depth and how that all works out. High tide, low tide, rocks, distance above rocks. Um, this section here talks about correcting the compass, which we'll be doing today. Uh, correcting for magnetic and compass uh, to get a true course. Um, and a lot of the stuff we'll be covering will be in this reference guide. Uh, it's awful handy to have on a boat because it will remind you of some of the little details. Uh, if I flip this over, um, it gets some simple quick reference guides. And again, just some of the navigation aspects that we can use, uh, chart symbols and how to sail in the fog and how to do a fix. Uh, and that's where you fix your position to figure out where you are. So those are some of the, that's another part of our toolbox here. And last but not least, um, one of the things that I, did when I chose today's trip is I chose a trip that would get us a little bit far away from land so we could practice navigating when we don't have landmarks. And when you start getting out of way of land, uh, it sometimes doesn't make sense in the middle of the ocean. I have a chart that is nothing but blank water. Uh, this is a chart. This is what's known as a plotting sheet. And you might recognize this. This is your compass rows. And this is your latitude lines here. These lines here are permanently fixed. I'm gonna just switch to another one. You notice they're permanently fixed. These are all lines of latitude, just like a ladder. And these are all equally spaced. And as we talked about last week, latitude lines are parallel and they are the same distance the whole way. Um, if you were to count this, you would find that there are 60 minutes in each degree. Each minute is one mile. Um, and that is works only on the latitude scale. Part of the reason I brought this out is we mentioned that the longitude scale, the up and down that tells you how far east or west you are, um, is narrower at the, at, the, at the upper end, and this is 70 degrees north, and down here at the equator is the only place that your latitude and longitude are the same distance. Now we're up here, you know, uh, and, and uh, up in this area here. So our longitude is really only that far apart. And I've got this other sheet and I set this sheet up and this basically reflects the area that we are now. We could actually just put, you know, Mystic Seaport right here and then go ahead and just plot out what we did on our courses. And we could put our various fixes. This is really used when you're offshore and a lot for celestial navigation, but it does give you the information. Um, you know, I set these vertical lines, these lines of longitude up using this longitude scale. And uh, <clears throat> as I said, that represents at the equator. So you notice your longitude and your latitude are equal at the equator. But here, at 40 degrees north, it's much narrower. So here is one degree of longitude. And you can see what we've done here. 
and I went ahead and I put my numbers 40 degrees approximately where we are, 41 degrees north, 40 degrees north, 39 north, and then our, uh, our longitude going there. Uh, as discussed last week, um, notice that I put the N in here. Somebody had asked, they said, well, is, does it get negative when it goes below the equator? And it's like, no, when you're north of the equator, you would put 41 degrees north or 41 degrees uh, south if you were south of the equator. And notice that our longitude, as we indicated, uh, this is 70, uh, 70 west, 71 west, 72 west. We are moving westward from England or the Greenwich uh, meridian, zero degrees longitude. And since we're moving to the west, we're in the western hemisphere. So all of our uh, uh, latitudes and longitudes will be in, in west. So, so this is a plotting sheet, yet another tool. And this is great if you don't want to mark up your charts, you can use that. So, so that was just to introduce some of the stuff that we looked at last week. I'm going to move these out of the way and get down to our chart. Hey, Nicholas, uh, before yeah. you show this chart, is there any way to slide your phone just a tiny bit so that uh, I feel like we're seeing a tiny bit of the frame? Yes, that's perfect. That's, that's it. Yeah. Oh, now we see it on the other side. <laughs> slide it back just a little. OK, right there. I think that might be the, maybe that's the sweet spot. Yeah, I, OK. Maybe that's OK. Don't worry about it. it. It's not It's not too bad. Yeah. Well, I might have just made it worse. Sorry about that. <laughs> No, it's, uh, it's goofy. Sometimes it works fine and sometimes, yeah, there we go. There it is. That's what it is. Perfect. All right. Perfect. Thank cool. you. Thank you. All right. All right, folks. So um, <clears throat> that's just some of the stuff. Now I've got some other stuff, but I'm not going to introduce it because I do want to get started uh, on our trip uh, coming out the river and actually kind of do some stuff. Um, the first one, uh, first part of the trip is to transit from Mystic down the Mystic River. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch to our other chart in just a minute. But I'll just show that we're going to transit down here. And what I'm going to do is we have a chart that I'll be able to use. But I'm going to come down here, all the way down the river. We'll pass some buoys and so on and so forth. And then we'll get out into Fisher's Island Sound. And at that point, it'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and start drawing on the chart a little bit more. More, more accurately. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, uh, Krista, will you go ahead and switch me? I'm going to switch over to uh, the regular chart. So share screen. Yep. And let's see which is the one I want right here. So the share should be in the bottom right hand corner of your options. You got it now? Not yet. No. That's not a good sign. Because I've got it on my screen. Hmm. Hang on for me. Maybe cut maybe uh come out of it and then try to go back in. Yeah. There you go. Hold there on. Now okay. we're in. Sorry about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, here we go, folks. Um, you may remember this from last week. We looked at this chart in, uh, in a little bit of detail. And, uh, and I find it easier to work uh, using this one um, to uh, look at some of the details. So here's the Fisher's Island Sound chart. And we are up here in the Mystic River. So I'm going to zoom in quite a bit. OK. And, uh, and as we come across stuff, I'll remind us of what we looked at and so on and so forth. Um, what we're going to do coming down this river is generality. And what that means is uh, it, the, the term pilot is a, is a person who guides ships into harbors. Uh, and so piloting, when they come into a harbor, they usually don't necessarily navigate like you and I think of navigating. We're using a compass to figure out positions and three bearing fixes and things like that. What we often use is just use following the channel and the buoys and the markers and the aids to navigation to get us down that channel. And uh, as last week, as we discussed, you can see some of that right now. This is the channel starting at the Mystic River. There's a green buoy. And as we did last week, it says G. This is, that means it's green. It's a can, which means it's an unlighted can buoy. It looks like a soda can. And painted on the side is 53, OK? Um, Generally, uh, sometimes there'll be a red buoy on the opposite side of the channel. 
There isn't in this case because basically the shoreline acts to mark the edge of the channel, okay? Um, they put buoys where they need them. They don't always put reds with greens. Um, and so, so what we're gonna do is get ready to leave the seaport here and get ready to go. Now, before I leave for any trip, I like to go over a couple of things. And one is I wanna make sure that I have all my charts with me, that I have uh, the information that I'm gonna need to go out to Block Island. Um, I do have the Fisher's Island sound chart. I have the Block Island sound chart. And I also have a chart uh, at for Block Island itself. And it would be terrible to go all that distance and then not be able to safely go into the harbor because I didn't have the information I needed. So I've got that. And of course, the standard safety things apply. You want to make sure that you've got equipment and fuel and so on and so forth. I also like to check the weather and check the tide to find out what the tide is going to do. Um, in this case, uh, I've checked the tide and we went into the book and I'll, I'll do that in, uh, in a few minutes. But uh, um, we'll start our way now going down the chart. But this will just remind us a little bit of what we're looking at. Now, you'll notice these are a little close together. One thing that I like to do is you want to keep a written record on your chart of what you did. And one of the most important things is when you find out where you are, always put the time. So if I was leaving this dock right here, what I would do is I would put the time, and when I came a beam, when I was right beside, or that buoy was 90 degrees to my course, I would put a time down. I put a circle which says it's a visual fix, and I put a time. And I would work my way down the channel, and I would put a mark every single place. And that way, if I need to, in a hurry, look down, anybody can walk up to the chart and find out exactly where we are. If there's a problem or, uh, or if you have to go back and reference it, it gives you a, a great opportunity to keep track of what you're doing. It's also a great way to kind of watch your speed and we'll get into figuring out speed a little bit later. But basically as you come down the river here, you're gonna go ahead and transit down past each buoy. And as we talked about last week, this is a, the green buoys are odd numbers, 53, 51, 49, so on and so forth. Come down past Mystic Seaport. Here's our first red buoy, red 38. If we come in, you'll see why they put that there. There's a bunch of shallow water just on the inside. There's a two foot section there, one foot, one foot, one foot out here. And notice that, and then the, the, buoy, the channel itself is 12 feet deep. So this is dug out like a trench, like a little roadway to get us safely down the river, okay? We come up to the Mystic River Drawbridge, Bastille Bridge, which means it opens vertically. When it is closed, it has four feet of clearance. And just about the only thing that goes under that is a rowboat. So uh, it's always nice to check that. Uh, if you're in a powerboat, sometimes you can get in. This is at high tide. At low tide, you might have six feet of clearance. And, uh, you know, in any case, you want to make sure that it's high enough to get underneath. Uh, horizontal clearance is right here. So that just tells you how wide it is, okay? Uh, this bridge opens on uh, a demand early in the season and then 20 minutes off every hour. So you call the radio, the bridge operator up, tell him you want it open. He'll tell you to kind of kind of wait with the other boats. And when that opens up, you go through. Um, just, uh, just as courtesy safe, but also a right of the way thing, the boats that are, have the tide behind them, the tide, boats that are being pushed have the right of way. So they will transit the bridge first um, when you have the tide pushing you along, you lose a lot of maneuverability. So uh, that will get you through the bridge safely uh, and without disturbing. And then once all the boats that are going with the tide, uh, they'll go ahead and come back and go the other way. Uh, this right here is the Mystic uh, Train Bridge. Uh, this is a swing bridge and there's the detailed information on it. And this section here rotates 90 degrees and the correct tracks connect. Uh, vertical clearance. It's got a little more room there to, to, to get underneath. Uh, so most power boats could get under there, uh, but that's how, how that works. Okay, so same thing. Call up the bridge operator. Generally, this will stay open unless they've got a train coming. Uh, you call the operator. <clears throat> you, on your radio, you would use channel 13. So, all right, so we're working our way out. You can see the numbers are decreasing as we work down the channel. You can see how shallow it is. And there's even areas that there's just mud that sticks up at low tide, rocks. That's a rock there. We'll come down the channel. Now, this is a marina that's there. You can see all the docks. Same thing, you know, the marina kind of marks the edge of the channel. 
Here's a red one. This is an interesting one because this is not only a term, but there's another channel that starts and goes in here. And here you see the symbols change. You notice that these buoys, the can is a floating can, or the red one is known as, an, as a nun uh, for N, pointed top, flat top. These have the same symbols, but they don't, they're not buoys and they don't have that small circle. So these are, are what we call shoal poles or uh, they're basically stuck in the ground. So there's a pole stuck in and this has a, a triangle on it. And that triangle keeps you off of this rocky death right here. And this one keeps you in the four foot section instead of the, the three foot section. And that channel goes up and leads into, uh, uh, into uh, Mason's Island there a little bit, okay? So we're gonna continue our way out the river here. Um, here you see that the channel has been dredged to 11 feet, uh, 25 foot wide. Same thing at the docks, we're decreasing in numbers, buoys are this, this is all Mason's Island. Uh, we talked last week about uh, uh, the, the green versus the beige. This is all shallow water marshland, which is, could be flooded at all times. There's some up in here. So we'll work our way down. We start to see, we get into having more channels. Now you can see it's 11 feet inside the channel and it's three right on the edge. And if you were, if there was no water there, there would literally be a cliff right here or at least a steep incline, okay? Work our way out. Now we start to see what people will sometimes call a gate, a red buoy on one side, green buoy on the other. And, and they're working their way out. Uh, does anybody remember what side the red buoys go or what we say to keep us reminded of what side the red buoys go? We'll wait and see if something shows up in there. Um, here we have another gate and we work our way down. This is called the S curve. And here we have another channel that splits off and, uh, and goes down through the area. This area here is an anchorage. So when you come into Mystic, there's a whole bunch of uh, anchorage boats up in this area here. And uh, so we don't want to be going in through there unless we have to. And Nicholas? Uh, yeah. Looks like a lot of people are saying red right returning. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> yep. That's Everybody it. remembers that from safe boating, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and on the way out, I like to say red left on the way out, but it doesn't rhyme very well. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, so yeah, we've got another side channel going in here through the mooring area, so on and so forth. Notice that most of these are unlit buoys. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of a not wicked important channel like New London, so the, 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 the less expensive unlighted buoys uh, are, are cheaper and easier to maintain, uh, and we just don't get the kind of commercial traffic that you would expect to see uh, going into New London or Bridgeport or some of those major channels. Um, we do have some lights, but they're generally uh, just kind of help you in the dangerous areas. Uh, one of those areas is right here. We talked about this last week. This is Noank Light. Uh, this is a sort of a lighthouse or a tower, uh, quick green, 22 feet tall. It's got this exclamation point, which says it's a light, and that light is stuck in the ground, okay? It's visible for eight miles, 8 m. It's got a number five on it. And this area right here strikes fear into the hearts of scooter captains, because you've got to come around here nice and all of a sudden you enter this channel and not only uh, does it get kind of shallow right in here, uh, but this, this run here can get a little shallow. And another place where we've, a lot of people have had problems is right here. You know, they come out, they stray out of the channel a little bit, next thing they know they're in the mud. So when I used to bring boats with 12 feet of water drafting here, we would always do it about a half an hour before high tide. So we had as much water and also we had a little time if we did get stuck, we had time to work it out before the tide started going down again. Because if you don't get it off before the tide goes down, you get to spend uh, 12 hours there. So, all right, we got the white for the deep water and out. Here is Whale Rock. Uh, this is uh, fixed here, you know, it's got the exclamation point. Here we have a buoy with the triangle, uh, excuse me, the diamond, but this red mark here tells you it's a lighted buoy. And we can see right here, it's a red buoy, number four, uh, flashing red four seconds. So every four seconds, you have a red light flashing. And that's to keep you off a of whale rock. This rock is big and hard, and it also breaks the surface in some areas. And then we work our way, working our way out to the channel. Here's a green buoy put there to keep you off that four foot section. Uh, red buoy to keep you off a of swimming rock because it does get shallow into here. 
And then last but not least is can number one in um, the entrance of the channel. As I said last week, this is the beginning of the channel. The beginning of the channel will be buoy number one or two. Uh, and, uh, and of course the red one would be the number two. So that is basically how you would pilot coming down the river. If you were on a ship, uh, the, the pilot would be standing there uh, guiding the host person saying left, right, left, you know, and uh, well, what, what you normally do is we say, okay, just kind of head for the next buoy, head for the next buoy. Um, and uh, something that I've, just something, if you're working with uh, younger folks or if you want to make your guests feel comfortable, one of the best things you can do is send them up with a pair of binoculars and, and have them get the numbers off the buoys for you as they come back. They, it gets them involved in, especially you get like an eight-year-old eight year old with a pair of binoculars and run back and forth telling you where the buoys are and what numbers are coming up. And, and uh, it, it's really a nice way to involve them and get them in part of the, part of the cruise, you know? So, all right. So that's, uh, that's our mouth of the river here. I'm gonna go ahead and open up a little bit and we'll start looking at the rest of the trip here, okay? Now, as they come out, you can see a lot more of Fisher's Island Sound. You know, we just came out right about here. And now we're going to transit. The next section is this one in here. Uh, this is Fisher's Island Sound, the open water part. And then this is Watch Hill. Excuse me. Watch Hill is right here. And once we're here, we are in open water. So we need to navigate through here. And, uh, and just like uh, coming down the river, you'll find are unlit, but there are enough lit buoys so that if you're careful, you can find your way through at night, okay? Um, in this area, we'll be starting to use our compass, so I'm going to take a break, and we'll look at some of the tools and talk about figuring out a course, and the first thing we're going to do is find a course from the Ram Island number one to this uh, red that's off of the shoal, and I'll bring that in here, okay? Um, while I'm doing, while I'm bringing her in and getting a better look, um, can anybody remember some of the tools that we're going to use to plot this course? And what I'm going to look for is I'm looking for the course that runs from here right to here, right to this number 20 buoy. Hopefully it'll be a little bit straighter than that, but that's uh, that's our first section. So. Um, and now as I do with this line, if I draw a straight line, I can see I've got good water the whole way across, okay? I can see that if I go inside, I call that the Ram Island Red, uh, number 20, you can see that that would be a bad place. So what are some of the tools that we might want to use for this, uh, figuring out our course? Nicholas, people are saying uh, parallel rules, dividers, triangle. Yep, there you go. You want me to go to your other camera, Nicholas? Yes, let's probably just gonna say let's go to my other camera. Oh, you know what? I think you actually have to stop your screen share. Oh, okay. Well, that'd be good because that would give me a chance to open up the other chart. <laughs> I'm not as ready as I thought. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. All right. So stop share. All right. All right. Now I'm yeah. gonna go to your other camera. There we go. There we go. Good. Okay. I'm going to turn on the light here and see if that makes it a little better with it. The sunlight just stopped, so does that help at all? Oh, yeah, there we go. All right. All right, so, <clears throat> so somebody had mentioned parallel rules. So we've got our parallel rules, and that will help us transfer the lines around. And we've also got our compass rows over here, okay? What I'm going to do is we're going to work out the course. And then last week we talked a little bit about um, uh, uh, about errors introduced into the compass, variation and deviation. And we're going to spend a few minutes just working on some of those. Um, but the way you work out your course is I'm just going to take, I don't know if you can see this pretty well. Um, let me set up here. So here's green number one, Ram Island number one there. And here is the number 20 buoy. Can you guys see that okay? Or I can try to lower that a little bit. What do you think, Crystal? Um, I, th I mean, I think, it, let's see what people, what people think. Give me a thumbs up. Use the reaction button if you think it's okay. It says that people can see it fairly well. Some people are 
Yeah, saying it's fine. Okay, all right, well, we'll yeah, just proceed it. then. Okay, so what I've done is I put one edge of my ruler here on the green number one, and I put the other one right on the red 20. And this is the course I want to steer, and I'm going to steer it in this direction. Okay, I got my little pencil here, this is not a pen. So that line will represent that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk this, as we, went, we kind of went into this last week, these parallel rules will take this, this line and transfer it anywhere in the chart that you want. Um, you just got to make sure that you don't twist it as you're working it. So we'll line that up. I'm going to hold one. I'm going to shift the other one. And I'm going to walk it on over to the compass rows here. Okay. Step that there. And I'm going to walk it through until I reach this, this edge here. Sorry, this edge here meets the center of the compass rows, okay? And I'm going to bring that around. And because I have a terrible memory, I'm going to make a mark. And I'm going to make a mark on true, and I'm going to make a mark on compass. So that's what I want to do, okay? So this mark, I like to put arrows on there to remind me. So I'm going to go ahead and, and that's our course line here. This line and this line are the same, uh, same angle. Okay, now if I look down here, and my eyes are so old these days, it looks to be about 105 true. Okay, and then if I come back, we had talked about using the inner ring if we're using magnetic compass, which I'm going to do, and that looks to be, uh, wait, 150, 140, 130, 120, 120, 120 magnetic. So I'm going to go back to my line here. Okay. Hey Nicholas, can you yeah. um, can you do that little hand trick to uh, make the chart not so blurry? That worked I last it. week. I don't know if it works this week. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a little blurry on our end, but I'm right, wondering. Let me, if... try, I, let me try this here. We'll see how well it works. I'm gonna okay. put the camera in the holder and lower it down. I think. Okay very tricky because because you know as well as I did if I do it too fast then right we lose I know it. I was thinking you were okay because we could see the parallel rules but let's see okay hold on there that was looking good all right there we go let's do all that right. right there all okay right. all right so so here you can see the line I'm going to put one two zero degrees okay and this is important I'm going to put an M there meaning magnetic Okay, so that if I look at this, I automatically know what I'm doing. Okay, so I, if I steer from can number one, and I get my compass out and work my way along, I've got a compass here to help you kind of work that. Um, this right here is a magnetic compass. And if you look right here, you see that line? That's what they call the lubber line or the heading line. Now you want to go ahead and line that up so that it's over when you're driving the boat, it's over one, two, zero, okay? And then that will uh, get you down along this line here, okay? So that lubber line, and that's also a line you would use when you're gonna go ahead and take bearings, um, you know, so you kind of get uh, stuff like that, okay? All hey, right. Nicholas, we have a question that seems appropriate while we're at here at this moment um, okay. from Pierre in the audience asking, is it okay to fold a chart or should it be kept rolled? Uh, it's always nice to be able to keep them rolled and yet you always end up folding them because you just <laughs> need to. <laughs> They're awful big. The, the, the dream of every sailor is to have a chart table big enough to be able to unfold all the charts. And not, not a lot of us have those, so. Got it. So yeah, it does wrinkle them, but it's part of the part of you know that's what that's how they sell new charts. So, okay. <laughs> all right. So so we've got the, that that course there. Okay, we got a time. Let's just call this twelve o'clock. Okay, we got to that point because remember we're marking that all along, and then we're going to go ahead and work our way along this course. Okay, so let's say we get here uh, in, in in one hour, or well, let's uh, that's actually about. Let's call this 12.25, okay? Uh, let's make it simple. I'm gonna make it 15 minutes, 12.15, okay? Oops. All right, so now we're there, we're at Ram Island 1, and then we look out and we could see that uh, we're gonna need to alter course, 
And this is where I'm going to run into a little bit of trickiness. And, uh, you know, I think that we might have to, I might not be able to do that. Well, let me, let me just try this. I'm going to juggle the things a little bit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch back. This chart isn't gonna work on this. Let's go back. I'm gonna introduce another chart in the shared shared file. Okay. All right. Let me go back and uh, thanks for. Right, I'll do this one and then the last one. Yep. Okay. Let me go back and spotlight your video. Thanks everyone for hanging in with us. All right, there you go. There we go. All right, so this is the, uh, <clears throat> uh, so I'm looking at the time crystal and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and we're gonna start from this chart. Okay. 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 All right. So here we are. Um, here's Ram Island. That buoy we were just looking at was right here. And now we wanted to go ahead and get a course line here and work our way out the lighthouse here. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and switch to this other chart real quick. Uh, I think you're going to have to reshare your screen. I don't yeah. know if you can go back and forth between them, Nicholas. Yeah. All right. Or very all right. easily. Well, anyway. I'm just going to go on from here. All right. So, all right. So, so basically, uh, we just so figured it, out how to get to here. We would do the same process to to work our way along here. Hey, Nicholas, your screen share actually is not on. No. You have to go back into it and do that again. No. No. What did I do? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. You know how technology is. I yeah. see lots of smiles. People, people know what we're dealing <laughs> with here. <laughs> the good news is, is if you're on a boat with Nicholas, things are going to be totally fine. All right. Do you have it now? You're good. You yep. Got, you're you good. You're good right? now. Yep. Right. Go for it. I'm going to stop and breathe for a second. All right. So. So here is, uh, I'm going to work our way out Fisher's Island Sound here, okay? And <clears throat> we would do the same technique and we would just work our way along here as well, okay? And basically a long straight line. One of the places we'll stop and go by is Latimer Light, okay? Oops. Okay, and Latimer Light is right here and that is the same symbols we looked at well, as no egg light. It's lighted, 26 uh, flashes every six seconds. It's nice and tall. It's got a bell so you can see it at night. This is a good landmark. And what I would do here is I would go ahead and um, put a mark and mark what time we got to Latimer Light. Part of the reason we're doing that is to figure out how fast we're going as we work our way along the, 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 the coast here, okay? Um, and we'll continue to sail our way along. I'm gonna come down a little bit, okay? And we'll continue this along. And our next point is this one right here. And this is pretty much a straight line from, from, Ram, from the Ram Island Shoal Red Buoy all the way down. It's all just one shot right here. And this is the, uh, this is Napa Tree Point Light. Same thing, this is a lighted buoy, okay? And this is gonna tell you uh, where you, you're getting set up and so on and so forth. At this point, you know, you come by here, put your time down, 
and, uh, and then you go ahead and steer for Watch Hill Passage. Now Watch Hill Passage is right here. This is Watch Hill. You've got a great big lighthouse on the point. This is a, a, a super one. It's uh, tall. It's, you can see it for 14 miles. Um, this is a big magnitude lighthouse. Also Taylor Swift, uh, Taylor Swift lives over in here. All the kids want to know that. You have an unlit buoy, unlit buoy. And this is the one that I usually aim for. It's a lighted buoy and it's a little bit taller and a little bit bigger. So we get on over there and we work that out, okay? So, um, so our time here and our time here, okay? And then this becomes uh, <clears throat> where we jump off into the open waters of, uh, of, of the Block Island Sound, okay? So I'm gonna open this up a little bit more. Yeah. And you can see that uh, the chart basically ends at this point here. And I'm gonna hopefully be able to switch back to that other chart, okay? Um, I'm gonna do, One thing, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and switch charts now, okay? Okay. I'm gonna stop share. Yep, and then go to your other chart. Yeah. Perfect. There and there. Okay, nope, share. Still thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Now I got a little too fancy, it looks like. <laughs> this doggone Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's my fault. I, I lost it. It's not in, the, not in the list anymore. So. Is it one of the ones you have uh, under your cell phone? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just going to have to go ahead and We'll go do the old fashioned way. All righty. Let's switch you over. There right. we go. All right, there we go. All right, so at this point, all right, you wanna go ahead and put me back on regular screen now? Yep, it, it is. Okay, all right. It should be, Nicholas, I've got it on the camera showing your hands or your cell phone camera. There it is, there it is. Okay. Yeah, boy, I'm having a hard time today. Sorry about this, folks. All right, folks, well, we'll breathe and take a break. Uh, <laughs> here's Watch Hill Passage. We came out through here. Here's Latimer Light right here. You actually you can see where somebody took a couple of bearings on it and they got their way out to Watch Hill Passage. Um, at this point, uh, we're going to start losing our area because things get so wide open out in this direction. And you cannot even see Block Island from, uh, from Watch Hill Passage, except for the clearest days you get a chance to see that. Okay, so what we need to do is we have to do it kind of the old fashioned way. And we're going to do uh, a technique known as distance equals speed times times or dead reckoning uh, is another name. Now, just like I figured out the course last time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start my parallel rules uh, right here at Watch Hill Passage, and I'm going to put it right here at the entrance to Block Island, right over here. Okay, and I'm going to draw my line. Okay, and then I'm going to go down just like I did before, and I'm going to bring it down into the parallel rules. Okay, I've got again one, two, one, one, eight. Let's call it one, two, zero again. One, two, zero degrees magnetic. Okay. And that, uh, <clears throat> and that will be the course we have to steer. Now, if we want to figure out distance, I could come to my latitude scale. Okay. And just, I'm going to preset my dividers. Okay. And we talked about the scales being in a couple of different places here. Um, I've got one up here. Okay. 
and zero, and that's five miles, okay? And just like we talked about, the longitude scale is also each, uh, excuse me, latitude scale, each scale is, is, uh, represents one mile as, w as uh, well. One minute of latitude equals one mile. I'm gonna come back. And that would represent five miles. And I flip it over. That represents 10 miles. Okay. And then it's not quite 15 miles. So right to the entrance buoy right here uh, is that much. And then I'll go up to my scale and add that. So it's 10. So it looks like about 13 and a half miles. Okay. So now the next question is, uh, we're gonna to wanna to sail along that line. We're gonna steer a nice straight course, or hopefully, the reality is it's gonna vary. So we're gonna be on that line for a while. The big next question is, is when are we gonna get there and how does that work out? Um, when you're talking about figuring out distance and time, um, they kind of all come together. And the basic formula is D equals ST. Distance equals speed times time, okay? Now, uh, there's a lot of different ways of figuring out how fast you're going. Um, you know, automobiles have an, a, a, a speedometer. We usually have what we call a log, and a log just basically means it's keeping track of how fast you're going. When we were coming out the river, we wrote, we wrote down where, when we, um, uh, we, we noted the, mar the, the marked all the buoys as we came by them. And uh, we can use that to figure out how fast we're going. Um, we can convert it into different things. But basically, if you go one nautical mile an hour, 6,080 feet, that equals one knot. In the old days, when they wanted to figure out how fast they were going, they would use a chip log or a knot log. And they would literally have a piece of string with a chip on the end, they would throw it over the side of the boat or the stern of the boat and then count how much line went out in a given set of time. That usually is about 22 seconds. Um, they would mark it with knots on the string and the amount of the knots that pass through your hand in the allotted time would tell you your knots or how many nautical miles an hour you were going at the time. Um, that was the first, first way of measuring your speed. Um, that evolved into uh, this mechanism here. This is a taft log. And this taft log, uh, you have a spinner that you throw over the back of the boat. And this thing spins in your wake as the tide goes by and turns by this rope the dial. And that will tell you how many miles you've gone. And of course, you would note what time you threw it over and what time you brought it back in. So you could go check this once an hour. And that was a standardized method to check your, your distance every hour and write it down. And then you could say, well, if one hour I went 12 miles, I must be doing 12 knots. Um, so that was one way they figured it out. Um, the modern uh, log uses uh, uh, basically a little spinner on side of the boat, and it just tells you how many knots you're going that way. And uh, once you can figure out the speed, then you can go ahead and uh, figure out how long it's gonna to take to get there and what your ETA is. Another method is what's known as the Dutchman's log. And you actually just mark a distance on your boat, uh, say 30 feet, and then throw an object. And when it passes the first point, you, stop, you, you start your stopwatch. And when it passes the second, you stop it. And the distance traveled in feet, uh, uh, it could be converted to knots very, fairly easily. Um, I have an example here. Uh, you know, and that's what this is right here. Uh, it's just, uh, if you went, uh, from, took you five seconds to go 30 feet, and then you times that by the amount of seconds over the, the amount of feet in a mile, basically you're transferring miles per hour into feet per second. Um, it's fairly straightforward to do. It's kind of fun to do if you don't have another method. And then what we used to do when we were kids, we would just kind of guess, and you find that you got to be pretty good at it. But one of the things about navigating is you want to make sure that you're always checking your work. So as you come down the river, you start to figure out how fast you're going, what kind of speed you're making. And, uh, and then that gives you an idea of, um, uh, and that gives you an idea of 
how fast you're going and how fast the boat is capable. With power boats, it's particularly helpful because you can go ahead and figure that when you're doing certain, certain engine RPMs, you're always going a certain speed. Sailboat's a little bit trickier, but it's still a viable way of getting about it. So if we have 13 and a half miles here, if we were going 13 and a half knots, it would take us an hour. If, uh, if we were going less than that, it might be a little bit different for us. Now, uh, basically the DST says D, distance, equals speed times time. Okay, that's the classic formula uh, for that. If I put it in this formula and I put S times T like this, D over S T, if I cover any one of these, if I want to find out what my speed is, I can put my finger over S, distance over time, in other words, how, far, how time into distance will tell you uh, what your speed is, or if your speed time, or over your distance, so if you go, if your distance uh, divided by speed would give you time. Speed times time, so you know, if you're doing five knots times one hour equals five, then distance is five, so on and so forth. So this is a fairly basic formula. Um, and they use, a, I had a, one of the things that's really nice to be able to use is this little handy dandy tool here. And this speed distance time uh, will do that math for you. What's nice about it is, is it does it quickly and easily. So for instance, if we, uh, have a distance of, let's set this black, uh, this is black yards, set this at, um, green is not as mild as we said, 13, right? So 13 miles, okay? And let's say we did 13 miles in four hours. I would turn this to four hours, okay? And that would give us a speed of just a little bit over three knots. And uh, this thing is, is very handy to have, and uh, just about every boat I know has some version of these. Um, it saves you a little bit of doing the math. Uh, another trick that I do for the quick and dirty is just figure out how long it takes you to go one mile. So for instance, if you're going six knots, it takes about 10 minutes to go a mile. So if you go down the channel and you do one mile or between two buoys, uh, and that'll give you some, some reference for that. So. So that's that, that would be the speed. So we could figure out uh, that. Now, as we started sailing, the thing that we do here now is we start sailing along our 120 course and uh, we start to dead reckon. So we say, okay, well, if I'm doing, you know, I'm doing five knots. If I left here at, uh, you know, 12 o'clock, and I come out five miles, I've gone one hour at five knots, I'll come over to my scale, I'm using the latitude scale off to the left here, um, I can come out, I can measure off my distance, and in theory, I would be somewhere around here, okay? Um, that is my, my dead reckoned position. This is 12 o'clock, this is gonna be 1300. The way that we mark this, because this is a guess, is I'm gonna put a half circle around it, okay? So this is a dead reckon position. It is not wicked accurate, because you gotta remember, you know, the current's moving, the tide's moving. Um, you may be changing speed a little bit. Um, your, your course, you'll find, is not straight in the hour, is moving like this, but it's still better than nothing, and it gives you a reference. In the old days, they would go all way across the Atlantic and very often this is all they would have it's just using dead reckoning so uh, it, it, it does work so an hour later you come here and then this wind slows down and you start to, to, to only do about four knots and then you could go ahead and uh, you know do that for your next hour uh, I'm gonna put four knots out come down to speed here okay half circle 1400 okay so this is a great, if you've got nothing else. Now there are some times when you can get bearings and things off the shorelines or some of the lights and buoys. One of the reasons I chose this area is because there's not a lot. So you have a starting point back here at Watch Hill and everything up till now is based on that start. If we've got a current moving along this way at one knot, every hour it's going to push you that way one mile. Okay, and that could be substantial. So you could be here, you'd be here instead. 
okay? What we can do now is we're starting to get close to Block Island. We might be able to see this light, for instance, okay? There's a light out here. Uh, we might be able to see buoys here. Uh, we might be able to see something on the end of Block Island, okay? So I'm gonna get my, my compass or my hand bearing compass uh, and basically sit right here, look through my hand bearing compass. We talked about this last week. I'm gonna look right through this section right here and you can see, I think you can see the numbers there. And I'm gonna hold it up so that this buoy appears right here, right above the number. And whatever number that is, I'm gonna go ahead and use that. Now we're gonna reverse backwards and we're gonna say, okay, well, I got a bearing over here. And uh, what I would do is come to the compass rows instead. And I'm gonna make this fairly simple and just go uh, right to here, which is 090 magnetic. Since I'm using magnetic compass, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, um, so I get this lined up at 090. I'm gonna walk this over so it goes through the buoy and I'm gonna draw a line. Okay, I'm gonna mark it 090, okay. That means that if things go well, we're somewhere on this line, okay? And just like, last, we don't know where, we could be here, we could be here, we could be here. Uh, and just like last week, we're gonna go ahead and we'll get another bearing. And we'll go ahead and we'll take a bearing on the, the light buoy at the entrance of the channel, okay? So I get a bearing, let's say it's bearing, uh, you know, 120, because that would seem to be a pretty good one. And I'm gonna come over here, work my way over. Okay, can you still see it there? Yep. And I'm gonna line it up right in here, okay? And I'm gonna cross, okay? And that is one, two, zero, okay? So I've got a cross suddenly, so I know I'm narrowing it down quite a bit, so I could consider myself there. And like we discussed last week, we like to throw in a third so that you can make sure that, you know, one of these two isn't wrong. So let's say I could see the whistle down here, okay? And, uh, and I, 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 I come down and I, I read, uh, looked at the compass and I see that down at, uh, 150, 160, 165 or so, okay? And then I work that back over. So it goes through the buoy, okay? And then I draw my line. And as we said, like last week, I have a diamond. I don't have a cross, but that's pretty good. So I know that I'm there. Now our DR puts us here, but since this is a much better position than the DR, I would go back and I'd start using that as we worked our way down here to work into the harbor, okay? Um, so that's a three bearing fix. And at that point we can adjust and say, okay, well the harbor entrance is much more like right about there, okay? So that's that. Now I, I know that I'm running a little over time, so I'm just gonna go over a couple of things that we talked about. Um, <clears throat> one was correcting the compass and the compass course. And, uh, and another is I'll just show you a quick look at the charts as we work our way in here, okay? Um, down in here, we talked about uh, the compass has two errors. One of them is variation. We talked about this star represents true north like that. And this one represents magnetic north like that. And that magnetic north uh, is basically due because there's a big chunk of iron up there in Canada or Northern America that attracts the compass. So it introduces an error and it swings the compass this way, okay? So we have to compensate for that. In the middle of the compass rows, it says 14 degrees, 45 minutes uh, is the, uh, is the, the um, variation at this point, okay? Um, there's an old adage and it says, can dead men vote twice at election? Can dead, can you see that? Dead men vote twice at elections. We can so see what it. What stands for is it's a way to switch. What's that? Can you see I it? I said we can see it. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, this is compass. This is for deviation. And deviation is an error introduced because of iron on board your boat or your boat. Okay. And if you correct for the compass for magnet, that gives you magnetic. Magnetic. <laughs> okay. 
then we have variation, and then this is true, okay? This says add east, okay? And that is, you're gonna add easterly error. Our error is to the west, so we would subtract it, okay? So our true course, okay? Our, our true course is about one, one, two, zero, okay? The variation is 14. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna call that 15 to make it easier, okay? If we're going down, we add the error. If we're going up, we subtract the error, okay? So west is best, we subtract west. So I'm gonna add that. So true plus 15. So 120 plus 15 is 135, okay? So true would be 120, magnetic would be 135. And then deviation, which really doesn't affect us a whole lot depending on the boat. We looked at brains and it was zero and one degrees. Um, and uh, so I usually don't, but if you're in a steel boat, that can be substantial. So let's say we've got 10 degrees uh, east, okay? We add east, we subtract east going back. So 125 would be what you would read on your compass after you cor corrected for your errors, okay? Now I know that was a quick go through. I, I'm, I'm kind of pushing myself a little bit as far as time frame. Um, but, uh, but I'd like to think that we can go into this a little more detail perhaps in another day. Um, but as we come down, you've done all your compass errors. I'm a little bit all over the place. But what you can do now is just start taking bearings on this as you work down. So this is where you were at 1400. And now you're just gonna check your position as you close in. You can start to get to the point where you can see this buoy here. So what I would probably start doing is taking another bearing, let's say in 15 minutes. And that bearing, let's say we get that and that comes out to uh, you know, 675075, you know, 075. And that's 1415. And then we just check our way down as we get in. A lot of times people will call this bearing a speed check, a bearing that's off to the side, because it really does kind of help get your bearings, your, your speed figured out. Okay. The other one that's this way would be a course check. You know, so as you come down, um, you could tell whether you were being pushed off or on. Uh, on your course. Now, one of the things that's gonna happen is you're gonna find that we did this, you know, we updated our position. I'm starting to get a little messed up there. But if we've got a current setting this way and it pushes us one nautical mile, uh, pushes us that way, our 1300 position might be there, but if we took a bearing fix like this, we might find that we were pushed over. And then that arrow is going to get worse and worse. So how do you compensate for that? Well, basically, if you do your bearings and you find that your DRs are here and your positions are here, basically, if you sail this distance in that direction, that'll send you down this line. Does that make sense? So, so from here, I would alter, this is a grammatic uh, difference, but if I steered here, from here to here, all right, then I could just go ahead and steer this and then that would give me that. So basically the gist is you steer this way a little bit further to compensate for the tide pushing you down that way. So, okay. Um, it's about what I got right now. I'm gonna go ahead and just pull up the Block Island chart and talk about coming into Block Island. Nicholas, we do have a few questions at the end for whenever you're, whenever okay. you're ready. So I'm just going to do a quick view of this, and then we can do questions. I, I imagine I, I'm, I apologize. I, I rushed myself to the end, and I was probably a little as far as what I was going to teach you today. Nicholas, so. we need unlimited sessions with you. <laughs> All right. Well, that's what I was really going for, so that I could get a chance to do this again. Part three. I think it's coming yeah. up. We actually already had a request for it. So. All right. All right, well, I, I promised to do that. All right, so here we have the Block Island entry. 
communications channel here. We've come sailing in. We've got a nice red bell out here at the beginning. And then we have the jetty right here. And that has a lighted flashing buoy that'll help guide you in. And just like the channels we were talking about earlier, we have the red right returning. We have a green buoy here. Again, these are unlit. And then you come down the channel itself. It says sea tabulation, and on, on the chart, you'll find information. And that'll tell you how deep the channel runs and so on and so forth. And then you come into the Block Island uh, Anchorage area. And, uh, and that can be quite a busy place in the summertime. I've, I've had uh, no ends uh, to try to try to figure out places to anchor and what to do and so on and so forth. All right. So there, there's our Block Island entrance channel and so on and so forth. You can see we've got the depths in there. Okay. And it's not coming up so well. There we go. All right. All right. So I think that I've embarrassed myself enough. <laughs> Nicholas, um, you're fine. All right. So um, that's kind of where I think we can stop for today. Um, Guess we can look at some of the things. There is a lighthouse here. This would be a great one for doing a bearing on uh, coming into uh, into the island, and and that's what it basically I would do coming in along here. Um, you can see a position that we have here. This is an older position that was put down, and just like all positions, it has a triangle represents a 12 o'clock or 11:50 fix, and this is the course line, and that's the what we're steering, and. Uh, and so, so that that is that. Um, all right. Nicholas, I'm wondering uh, if we might want to. I'm wondering if we might want to turn part three into coming into the harbor, like this part you were just going to show. We could do that yeah. uh, in a coming session. I think so. I, There's a lot of requests for it. I don't know if you're looking I, uh, at the chat box, but uh, a lot of yes. people are asking for part three. <laughs> so, yeah. no, you get, I, you're getting I, a lot I, of things, despite technology issues. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate your patience and, uh, and, and I would love to do a part three. So yes, it'll be a part three. And, and just like the first one, I figured we can kind of go over um, what we've gone over a little bit, kind of go into the three bearing fixes and then start looking at some more advanced stuff um, or, or refining what we've got and do this again. Again, maybe uh, maybe this trip or another one. I'll look at the charts and see what you're easier to Good. do. Um, so, but that's so what you know. What, we had what, one question a little questions? while back that I just was going to wait until the end for. Somebody asked if you had a recommendation on a type of binoculars. Kind of, I think whenever we were talking about coming out at Watch Hill and not being able to see Block Island unless it's a clear day, I think maybe that's when that came up. Um, well, there's a lot. A lot of different types, and uh, and unfortunately, the better they are, the more they cost. It, and and it, rather than a type, I would say that just spending money, um, you know, you can get a good, decent working yeah. pair of binoculars for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, I would try to find them, you know, some that are a little shock resistant, and you also don't want them to be too magnifying. A seven by fifty is a good size, and seven uh, fifty magnification in seven inches is the objective length. And if you get them too fine, when you hold them up, they're too wiggly and you can't see, you know? So, yeah. uh, so that would be good. But yeah, West Marine has some decent ones. Um, you know, there's uh, Steiner is a German manufacturer that's renowned and they get pricey. Fujinon, uh, again, makes just an amazing waterproof armored binocular. Uh, but you can find some really nice stuff in the $100 range. And uh, and yes, and as somebody say, they do make some that have a hand a compass built into them as well. Steiner, right. Steiner makes a real Steiner and Fujinon, you know. Yeah. Excellent. So all awesome, right. Nicholas. Well, I just want everybody to know that I, I'm, uh, I've uh, listened very closely in the chat. There's been some good, the, some great ideas have come out of the chat. So I'm going to save the chat from today to make sure that we know things maybe we could cover next time or for other sessions. So. Thank you all for your great feedback. Nicholas, thank you so much for um, sp you know, spending your time teaching us all of this stuff, um, which is so fun. So many thanks from the audience, um, from people all over. So we really appreciate it. And I hope there's a session three. We'll work on that as I'm working on the schedule. And um, thank you so much, Nicholas. And thanks to everybody for joining us.
Thank you, Crystal. And thank you, everybody, for your patience. We'll see you next time around. Bye. Have a great night, everyone. Bye, Nicholas. Thank you. Bye-bye.